Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe, a public domain recording for LibriVox.org, read by Jim Cadwell. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. She was a child, and I was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee. With a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, A wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabel Lee. So that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee, and the stars never rise but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so all the night tide I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. A Child's Nightmare by Robert Graves Read by Joy Chan for LibriVox.org Through long nursery nights he stood, by my bed unwearying, loomed gigantic, formless queer, purring in my haunted ear, that same hideous nightmare thing, talking as he lapped my blood, in a voice cruel and flat, saying for ever, Cat, cat, cat. That one word was all he said, that one word through all my sleep, in monotonous mock despair. Nonsense may be light as air, but there's nonsense that can keep horror bristling round the head, when a voice cruel and flat says for ever, Cat, cat, cat. He had faded, he was gone, years ago with nursery land, when he leapt on me again from the clank of a night train, overpowered me foot and head, lapped my blood, while on and on the old voice cruel and flat says for ever, Cat, cat, cat. Morphia drowsed again I lay in a crater by high wood. He was there with straddling legs, staring eyes as big as eggs, purring as he lapped my blood, his black bulk darkening the day with a voice cruel and flat, cat, 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 cat. He said, cat, cat. When I'm shot through heart and head, and there's no choice but to die, the last word I'll hear, no doubt, won't be charge or bomb them out, nor the stretcher-bearer's cry, let that body be, he's dead. But a voice, cruel and flat, saying for ever, Cat, cat, cat. The Dawn Patrol by Paul Boucher, read by Chip for LibriVox.org Sometimes I fly at dawn above the sea, where underneath the restless waters flow silver, and cold and slow. Dim in the east there burns a newborn sun whose rosy gleams along the ripples run save where the mist droops low, hiding the level loneliness from me. 
and now appears beneath the milk-white haze a little fleet of anchored ships which lie in clustered company and seem as they are yet fast bound by sleep, although the day has long begun to peep with red inflamed eye along the still deserted ocean ways. A fresh cold wind of dawn blows on my face, as in the sun's raw heart I swiftly fly and watch the seas glide by. Scarce human seem I moving through the skies, and far removed from warlike enterprise, like some great gull on high whose white and gleaming wings beat on through space. Then do I feel with God quite, quite alone, high in the virgin morn, so white and still and free from human ill, my prayers transcend my feeble earth-bound plaints, as though I sang among the happy saints with many a holy thrill, as though the glowing sun were God's bright throne. My flight is done. I cross the line of foam that breaks around a town of gray and red, whose streets and squares lie dead beneath the silent dawn. Then am I proud that England's peace to guard I am allowed, then bow my humble head in thanks to him who brings me safely home. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kayvon Sylvan Dora by Thomas Edward Brown She knelt upon her brother's grave, my little girl of six years old. He used to be so good and brave, the sweetest lamb of all our fold. He used to shout, he used to sing, of all our tribe, the little king. And so unto the turf her ear she laid, to hark if still in that dark place he played. No sound, no sound, death's silence was profound, and horror crept into her aching heart, and Dora wept. If this is as it ought to be, my God, I leave it unto thee. End of poem. Read on January 3rd, 2006, in San Jose, California, USA. From lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey by William Wordsworth. Read by William Dodson for LibriVox.org. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still, sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods, and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart, and soul of all my moral being. End of From Lines Composed a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's recording is by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 4th, 2006. The Highwayman 
by Alfred Noyes. The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees, the moon a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, the road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, and the highwaymen came riding, 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 the highwaymen came riding up to the old inn door. He had a French cocked hat on his forehead, a bunch of lace at his chin, a coat of the claret velvet and breeches of brown doe skin. They fitted with never a wrinkle. His boots were up to the thigh, and he rode with a jeweled twinkle. His pistol butts a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle under the jeweled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard. He tapped with his whip at the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled. A tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love-knot into her long black hair. And dark in the dark old inn yet a stable wicket creaked, where Tim the ostler listened. His face was white and peaked, and his eyes were hollows of madness. His hair like moldy hay. But he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red-lipped daughter. Dumb as a dog, he listened, and he heard the robber say, One kiss me, bonny sweetheart, I'm after a prize tonight, but I'll be back with the yellow gold afore the morning light yet. If they press me sharply and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He stood upright in the stirrups. He scarce could reach her hand, but she loosed her hair in the casement. His face burnt like a brand as the black cascade of perfume came tumbling o'er his breast, and he kissed its waves in the moonlight. Oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight! Then he tugged at his rein in the moonlight and galloped away to the west. He did not come in the dawning. He did not come at noon. But out of the tawny sunset, before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon looping the purple moor, a redcoat troop came, marching, marching, marching. King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They spoke no word to the landlord. They drank his ale instead. But they took his daughter and bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casement with muskets at their side. There was death at every window, and hell at one dark window, for Bess could see through her casement the road that he would ride. They bound her up to attention with many a sniggering jest. They bound a musket beside her with the muzzle beneath her breast. Now keep good watch! And they kissed her. She heard the dead man say, Look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though else should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years. Till now, on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger, at least, was hers. The tip of one finger touched it. She strove no more for the rest. Up she stood to attention with the muzzle beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing. She would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight. Blank and bare in the moonlight. And the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Had they heard it? The horse hooves ringing clear. Talat, talat, in the distance. Were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight and over the brow of the hill the highwaymen came, riding, riding, riding. The redcoats looked to their priming. She stood up straight and still. Talat in the frosty silence. Talat in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer. Her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath. 
than her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight, and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred to the west. He did not know who stood bowed with a head or the musket drenched in her own red blood. Not till the dawn he heard it, and his face grew gray to hear how Bess, the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shouting a curse at the sky with the white road smoking behind him. His rapier brandished high, blood red were his spurs in the golden noon. Wine red was his velvet velvet coat when they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway with a bunch of lace at his throat. Ah, but still, of winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, and the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a high ribbon comes, riding, riding, riding. A high ribbon comes, riding up to the old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn-yard. He taps with his whip at the shutters. But all is locked and barred. He whistles. A tune to the window. And who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter Bess. The landlord's daughter plating a dark red love knot into her long black hair. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to find out about how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ray Bush January 6, 2006 I'm Nobody by Emily Dickinson I'm Nobody. Who are you? Are you Nobody, too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. End of poem Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll a public domain recording for LibriVox.org, read by Jim Cadwell. Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the bora groves and the mome wraiths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird and shun the frumenous bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the manxome foe he sought, So rested he by the tum-tum tree, And stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, The jabberwock with eyes of flame Came whiffling through the tulgy wood, And burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through The vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head He went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, Kalu Kalay, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogroves, and the mome wraiths outgrabe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson Part One On either side the river lie 
long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the world and meet the sky and through the field the road runs by to many towered camelot and up and down the people go gazing where the lilies blow round an island there below the island of shalott willows whiten aspens quiver Little breezes dusk and shiver Through the wave that runs forever By the island in the river Flowing down to Camelot. Four grey walls and four grey towers Overlook a space of flowers And the silent isle embowers The Lady of Shalott. By the margin willow-veiled Slide the heavy barges trailed by slow horses and unhailed, The shallop flitteth silken-sailed, Skimming down to Camelot. But who hath seen her wave her hand, Or at the casement seen her stand? Or is she known in all the land, The Lady of Shalott? Only reapers reaping early In among the bearded barley Hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered Camelot. And by the moon the weeper wary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening whispers, tis the fairy lady of Shalott. Part two. There she weaves by night and day, a magic web with colors gay. She has heard a whisper say, A curse is on her if she stay To look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, And so she weaveth steadily, And little other care hath she, The Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear That hangs before her all the year, Shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near, Winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, And there the surly village churls, And the red cloaks of market girls Pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, An abbot on an ambling pad, Sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two and two, she hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights, and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead, came two young lovers lately wed. I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. Part three. A bowshot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red-cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The jemmy bridle glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see hung in the golden galaxy. The bridal bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot. And from his blazoned baldric slung a mighty silver bugle hung, And as he rode his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue and clouded weather, thick jeweled stone the saddle leather, The helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, 
Below the starry clusters bright, Some bearded meteor trailing light Moves over still Shalott. His broad, clear brow in sunlight glowed, On burnished hooves his war-horse trod. From underneath his helmet flowed His coal-black curls as on he rode, As he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river He flashed into the crystal mirror, Tira lira by the river sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, She made three paces through the room, She saw the water-lily bloom, She saw the helmet and the plume, She looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, The mirror cracked from side to side, The curse is come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Part Four in the stormy east wind straining, The pale yellow woods were waning, The broad stream in his banks complaining, Heavily the low sky raining Over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat, Beneath a willow left afloat, And round the prow she wrote, The Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, Like some bold seer in a trance, Seeing all his own mischance, With a glassy countenance, Did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day, She loosed the chain, and down she lay, The broad stream bore her far away, The Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white, That loosely flew to left and right, The leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night she floated down to Camelot. And as the boat head wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the water-side, singing in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, Knight and burgher, lord and dame, And round the prow they read her name, The Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here? And in the lighted palace near Died the sound of royal cheer, And they crossed themselves for fear All the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space, he said, She has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace, the Lady of Shalott. End of The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alden Hines The Lake Isle of Innisfree By William Butler Yeats I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, And a small cabin build there, of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, And live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, Dropping from the vales of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, And evening full of linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day, 
I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray. I hear it in the deep heart's core. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alden Hines. The Lamb by William Blake. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed, by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild, he became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb, we are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee, little lamb, God bless thee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christina Peterson and Richard Hart. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. S'io credesse che mia riposta fosse a persona che mai tornasse al mondo, questa fiamma staria senza più scosse, ma per ciò che già mai di questo fondo non torno vivo alcun, si odo il vero, senza tema d'infamia ti rispondo. Let us go then, you and I when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent, to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time. There will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you, and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, 
talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair. With a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin, they will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and, in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball to roll it towards some overwhelming question to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it, at all. And would it have been worth it, after all, would it have been Worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more. It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. 
That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an intended lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous. Almost, at times, the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot Read by Christina Peterson and Richard Hart Music, copyright 2005 by William Cushman For more information about the music of William Cushman, please visit ghostnotes.blogspot.com for more information about LibriVox, please visit LibriVox.org. This has been a LibriVox recording. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alden Hines Loveliest of Trees, The Cherry Now by A. E. Houseman Loveliest of Trees, The Cherry Now Is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland dried, wearing white for Easter tide. Now of my threescore years and ten, twenty will not come again, and take from seventy springs a score, it only leaves me fifty more. And since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs are little room, about the woodlands I will go, to see the cherry hung with snow. The Matrix by Amy Lowell Read by Betsy Bush for LibriVox.org Goaded and harassed in the factory That tears our life up into bits of days, Ticked off upon a clock which never stays, Shredding our portion of eternity, We break away at last and steal the key which hides a world empty of ours. Ways of space unroll, and heaven overlays the leafy, sunlit earth of fantasy. Beyond the ilex shadow glares the sun, scorching against the blue flame of the sky. Brown lily pads lie heavy and supine within a granite basin. Under one, the bronze-gold glimmer of a carp. 
and I reach out my hand and pluck a nectarine. End of The Matrix Ode to Spring by Robert Burns A public domain recording for LibriVox.org Read by Jim Cadwell When mocking bucks at early fucks in the dewy grass are seen, sir, and birds on boughs take off their mouths among the leaves say green, sir, Latona's son looks licorice on Dame Nature's grand impetus, till his prick or eyes then westward flies to Roger Madame Thetis. Yon wandering rill that marks the hill and glances o'er the bracer, slides by a bower where many a flower sheds fragrance on the day, sir. Their daemon lay with Sylvia gay, till love they thought nae crime, sir. The wild birds sang, the echoes rang, while daemon's arse beat time, sir. First with the thrush is thrust and push, had compass large and long, sir. The blackbird next, his tuneful text, was bolder, clear, and strong, sir. The linnet's lay came then in play, and the lark that soared the boon, sir, till Damon fierce mistimed his arse, and fucked quite out of tune, sir. A Poison Tree by William Blake A public domain recording for LibriVox.org Read by Jim Cadwell I was angry with my friend, I told my wrath, my wrath did end. I was angry with my foe, I told it not, my wrath did grow, and I watered it in fears, night and morning with my tears, and I sunned it with smiles and with soft deceitful wiles, and it grew both day and night till it bore an apple bright, and my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine, and into my garden stole when the night had veiled the pole. In the morning glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. The Red Cross Nurses by Thomas L. Masson Recorded by Chip for LibriVox.org Out where the line of battle cleaves the horizon of woe, And sightless warriors clutch the leaves, The Red Cross Nurses go. In where the cots of agony mark death's unmeasured tide, Bear up the battle's harvestry, the Red Cross nurses glide. Look where the hell of steel hath torn its way through slumbering earth, The orphaned urchins kneel forlorn and wonder at their birth, Until above them, calm and wise, with smile and guiding hand, God looking through their gentle eyes, the Red Cross nurses stand. The Red Cross Spirit Speaks by John Finley, recorded by Chip for LibriVox.org Wherever war with its red woes, or flood, or fire, or famine goes, there too go I. If earth in any quarter shakes, or pestilence its ravage makes, thither I fly. I kneel behind the soldier's trench, I walk mid shambles, smear and stench the dead I mourn. I bear the stretcher, and I bend o'er Fritz and Pierre and Jack to mend what shells have torn. I go wherever men may dare, I go wherever woman's care and love can live, wherever strength and skill can bring surcease to human suffering or solace give. I helped upon Haldora's shore. With hospitaller knights I bore the first red cross. I was the lady of the lamp. I saw in Solferino's camp the crimson loss. I am your pennies and your pounds. I am your bodies on their rounds of pain afar. I am you, doing what you would if you were only where you could. Your avatar. The cross which on my arm I wear, the flag which o'er my breast I bear, is but the sign of what you'd sacrifice for him who suffers on the hellish rim of war's red line. The Shivering Beggar by Robert Graves Read by Joy Chan for LibriVox.org Near Clapham Village, where fields began, St. Edward met a beggar man. It was Christmas morning, the church bells tolled. The old man trembled for the fierce cold. St. Edward cried, 
It is monstrous sin, a beggar to lie in rags so thin. An old grey beard and the frost so keen. I shall give him my fur-lined gabardine. He stripped off his gabardine of scarlet, and wrapped it round the aged varlet, who clutched at the folds with a muttered curse, quaking and chattering seven times worse. Said Edward, Sir, it would seem you freeze, most bitter at your extremities. Here are gloves and shoes and stockings also, that warm upon your way you may go. The man took stocking and shoe and glove, blaspheming Christ our Saviour's love, yet seemed to find but little relief, shaking and shivering like a leaf. Said the saint again, I have no great riches, yet take this tunic, take these breeches, my shirt and my vest, take everything, and give due thanks to Jesus the King. The saint stood naked upon the snow, long miles from where he was lodged at Bow, praying, O oh God, my faith, it grows faint, this would try the temper of any saint. Make clean my heart, Almighty, I pray, and drive these sinful thoughts away. Make clean my heart, if it be thy will, this damned old rascal's shivering still. He stooped, he touched the beggar man's shoulder, and asked him, did the frost nip colder? Frost, said the beggar, no stupid lad, tis the palsy makes me shiver so bad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alden Hines The Tiger by William Blake Tiger, tiger, burning bright In the forests of the night, What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry. In what distant deeps or skies Burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art Could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, What dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, Dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears, And watered heaven with their tears, Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright In the forests of the night, What immortal hand or eye Dare frame thy fearful symmetry? The Tiger by William Blake A public domain recording For LibriVox.org Read by Jim Cadwell Tiger, tiger, burning bright In the forests of the night, What immortal hand or eye Could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dead grasp, Dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears And watered heaven with their tears, Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright In the forests of the night, What immortal hand or eye Dare frame thy fearful symmetry? The Walrus and the Carpenter By Lewis Carroll a public domain recording for LibriVox.org Read by Jim Cadwell The sun was shining on the sea, Shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright, And this was odd, because it was the middle of the night. 
The moon was shining sulkily, because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be. The sands were dry as dry. He could not see a cloud, because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead. There were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. O oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd, because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock, conveniently low, and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar, besides, are very good indeed. Now if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice, the carpenter said nothing but cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf, for I have had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick, after we have brought them out so far and made them trot so quick. The carpenter said nothing but the butters spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came there none, and this was scarcely odd, because they'd eaten every one. <laughs>